to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's up, guys? Another episode of Eastman's Elevated coming at you. So today on the podcast, I've got on my buddy Steve Drake. Um, Steve is just a an unreal photographer. Um, he, he takes some great shots, and he's actually made it his full-time job. He travels all around the country and all around the world, you know, taking different pictures of, of different hunts and different adventures, and, and he's just really good at it. He's a really good hunter, too. He, he kills a, a nice six-point every year with his bow, and then this year he killed a really nice muley buck, and, and uh, he's just a go-getter. He's always spending time in the mountains, and in springtime, he spends all of it hunting sheds. He's he's crazy about finding good sheds and puts a lot of effort into it and does it all the right way, and, and so today, we kind of talk about his adventures, and then I pick his brain about shed hunting since we are just in the heart of shed season right now, uh, or at least getting started in it, so really cool episode. You guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse. Um, Sportsman's Warehouse has done a great job building their brand, and they just run a really good store. Um, they've got everything in there that you need, but you can actually go in and try it on, and, and uh, you, you can test it and feel it and touch it. And, and uh, my, my good buddy actually runs the Fairbanks store, and he just works really hard at making the best store he can, having knowledgeable guys behind the counter that can give you good information on guns, bows, clothing, you know, knives, optics, whatever it is, they've got a specialized person in there to help you out. And, and they've done a good job at finding the best brands there are out there and offering the best brands to you guys. So thanks for sponsoring the podcast and, and uh, go give them some love, guys. Um, so at the Eastman's office, um, I'm headed over there tomorrow. I'm going to head over and record a few podcasts and see those guys and have a meeting about things. And and uh, so that would be cool to get over there. But we got uh, coming out on the hunting journal is our sheep issue. Um, so it's a really good issue coming out, and I talked about it on the last podcast, but um, I just wanted to talk about Brandon Mason. He's He's got um, Hunting the North Part 3 in this one, so he's already done Part 1 and Part 2, but it's all about a do-it-yourself adventure up in Alaska, um, and he does a, a great job at articulating you know, what's important and what's not and what you have to worry about. And, and it's just a great article that he wrote in there. So make sure you guys check it out, Hunting the North Country Part 3, and check out 1 and 2 as well. Um, he's just a great writer and super knowledgeable, so um, give that a read. And uh, so let's get this thing rolling. Um, we just recorded it. It's hot off the press. Steve actually just pulled right out of my driveway, and I'm going to release it tonight, recording this, and it's a done deal. So hot off the press. Here we go. Steve Drake, Eastman's Elevated. Okay, I'm live with Steve Drake. Steve, how are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Good. Man, thanks for making the run down and recording this thing for me. Uh, gosh, you're one of the first guys I thought of when I started this podcast. You know, you're just a, a DIY public land guy. You go out and you, you hunt really hard and you've been in successful on a bunch of really good bulls. Um, and, and then your videography and your photography is just awesome. It's just off the charts, man. I'm just super impressed. Thanks, man. No, I, I appreciate it. And it's... Uh fun to live in in uh, beautiful Montana because there's just so many opportunities um, here to spend time in the mountains and you know I grew up with a primarily like a, like a skiing background so I, mm -hmm. I ski raced a lot uh, in high school and college and you know with you know, that just that mentality of being in the mountains really really transpires over super well to to hunting in the mountains mm -hmm. and and now my, my career which is um, prim primarily photography and, and mountain hunting um, doc documenting like mountain, mountain type hunts and um, and documenting the, the crazy places that, that hunting takes people to. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's awesome to be, be from Montana and uh, utilize uh, this amazing resource we have here. So. Yeah, dude, you're so good at it. It's so fun to see your photography, like on your social media and stuff. And then you're traveling all over. Like you've set up your life to where now you're traveling, uh, photographing for these guys and not only hunting the 48, you're hunting all over the world. I mean, I saw... Uh, where were you hunting? It was just this wild place where you were hunting an ibex. Um, oh, it was. It looks like an ibex. It's uh, it's called a tur. A oh, Vegas okay. Dan tur, and that was in uh, Azerbaijan or Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. Pronunciation. Um, <laughs> last uh, was that last June? 
Mm -hmm. dude how wild is that and then like we've been trying to hook up for this podcast for the last couple months and you know you're always doing stuff and i'm always doing stuff so i'm just so psyched to get together with you but um just recently you were hunting goats in february yeah we were up in uh bc with my uh one of my friends adam yonke and uh yeah it's just really interesting the more the more i get into the industry the more i get into hunting the more i realize just you know how many opportunities there are for hunting kind of all over the place. Like, I mean, just in Montana alone, there's pretty much like two months out of the year that there's not a, a true hunting season going on. But, you know, you take that and you add all the opportunities in BC, all the other ones and kind of all over the, the, you know, the state and then out of state, um, out of country. Uh, this spring, I'm going to, actually a couple weeks, going to New Zealand for like 15 days. And then right after that, I'm going up to Kodiak, Kodiak, Alaska for uh, spring, spring brown bear uh, hunting. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's cool. I mean, you know, you, when I first got into this, I was like, God dang, like, how do you, how does one make this work? Cause it's, you know, hunting is only limited to the fall. And, you know, so if I'm out there creating content, it's like, you know, I need to be doing this more year round. So I'm like, well, do I need to supplement with, you know, getting into other, other industries? But it's like, oh no, there's just, you know, there's just as many opportunities outside of the fall hunting season as, as there is uh, within it. So. Yeah, it's just wild, man. You live an adventurous lifestyle. It's so fun to see. And then you did a brown bear hunt last year where uh, you guys were successful, right? We, well, we, we weren't successful. We uh, we did one um, out of Sitka, Alaska, and a uh, really, really cool hunt. Wait, wait, it was it was so much different than anything I've ever done before. We, we lived on this, what was it, like a, like a 100-foot boat for, mm-hmm. for 10 straight days. I was up there with uh, Jeff Spazito and um, yeah, just cruising around the, uh, um, inland passage and, uh, just, just looking for, for big brown bears coming out to the shore. And we saw a pile and we, man, we, we had some really close opportunities. It came down to the, the last five minutes of daylight on the last day of the hunt. So 10th day of the hunt, we're, we're actually, you know, take, taking the boat out and trying, trying to get back to, uh, the town of Sitka, which is, it was like an eight hour, um, boat ride. And, uh, spotted one on this random little island so we snuck in there and uh, it, was, it was such a shame there, there was another photographer right actually he was videoing on the hunt and um he just uh we were we come around this bend uh trying to get on this bear and it was going to be real close it's going to be like a 50 yard shot and at this point i mean jeff was, was bow hunting originally but at this point it's like well last hurrah like we're going to take the rifle and get her done and uh Unfortunately, that this other cameraman, he, he didn't realize the bear was right there, and so he, he kind of jumped out in front of everybody to to get a good um, get a different angle, um, and hopefully kind of set up a shot to, to film these guys going up on this bear, and the bear saw him and just bolted. And oh just no! Like, oh, such a shame. But it's, you know, it's like be, you know, being a uh, being a photographer, or being a content creator in this industry, it's like. I guess my opinion. I mean, you you've got to love hunting. You've got to be a hunter to, to do it best and to, and to understand it um, really really well, and also to not mess things up, you know. And so, just because as a hunter, it's like okay, like you know, it's okay. I'm I'm a hunter and photographer. It's like I see that bear. I know where that bear is. Like I'm always going to stay right behind the hunter. Like I'm not going to make sudden movements. And you know, those are those are skills that you don't just you're not just born with. Like you, you pick those up over years and years of hunting. And so. Um, I guess through 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 what I do, it's uh, I, I always try to go on my hunts and then be as experienced or more experienced than anybody else on that hunt, I mean, with the exception of a lot of the guys. But I just I really try to bring a lot of value to these hunts that I'm uh, documenting uh, beyond just taking photos. Like I'm trying to try to be there and helpful with the hunt and um, trying to uh, provide well, not necessarily guidance, but just you know um, to be someone uh, that can. Also, just just add to the hunt. Yeah, no, you well, and I think that's great. And we tried to put a hunt together last year, and I still want to really put one together with you because, like you say, you have that experience of hunting, and you're you're a successful hunter and a successful bow hunter, um, and so you know what it takes. But I think it is, you know, and I'm I'm brand new to hunting with a cameraman, but it seems like you kind of team up, and it's all it's just like hunting with one of your buddies. Yeah. He's just trying to capture everything on film or on camera and get his shots. But you know, for me, if I'm hunting with some 
somebody, I'm always bouncing ideas back and forth and we're always discussing things. And if, you know, me and you are on a hunt together, you want to kill that thing as bad as I want to kill it. And so we're trying to come up with the best game plan of how we're going to kill this mule deer or this bull or whatever we're after. Um, so no, that's just awesome. But boy, that's got to be the worst nightmare when it's the cameraman that screws up a big brown bear like that. Oh, especially the last, you know, last few minutes, the last day of the hunt after 10 days of pretty, pretty hard hunting. So yeah, it was a bummer for sure, but you know, it, it happens. It and, it's hunting, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Just good thing he wasn't left there stranded or something <laughs> after that deal. <laughs> yeah. It, it, Probably very well could have happened, but <laughs> well, and it's just part of it, you know. When you're hunting and trying to get things on film, you know, it's just tough. You're not trying to get one guy into position; you're trying to get two, or in your guys' case, three guys in yeah. position, you know, for the hunt. So definitely challenging. Yeah, no doubt, man. So yeah, it's 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 nice for for me. I mean, it's a natural fit for me because I do love hunting so much. Mm-hmm. And going and documenting guys that are also well, just that are that are hunting. It it, it makes a, a very uh, it's just a natural fit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's very natural for, for us to work together. To, the content is enforced. And, and the way that I, like, the way that I document hunts and shoot hunts, like, I'm not, we're not staging anything. I'm mm-hmm. not saying, hey, go walk over that ridge. It's just, like, how it unfolds, it's totally, like, documentary style. Um, and then we're not setting anything up. And so it, uh, it's a lot of fun. That's I the really best it. way to do it, isn't it? Where everything's organic and you just take the shots. And, and good photos come from doing cool things. Like, it doesn't come from trying to pretend or trying to set up a shot or anything like that. It comes from actually doing it. Being in those mountains or being in, like like you guys, it's probably coastal rainforest where you were hunting those brown bears. Isn't it pretty wet? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Oh boy, how did you keep your cameras dry during that <laughs> deal? Well, I got a little excited one day because... Uh, it was the second day of the hunt, and I, I've always I always take two camera bodies. Well, actually three now, but um, I, I always have two camera bodies on me at all times when I'm shooting. So I've got I've got one on my chest and one on my side, one with like a big zoom lens, one, one with a wide angle. And uh, second day of the hunt, well, let me preface, preface this: I I love shooting in really bad gnarly weather because there's just so much like human emotion that comes out, um, and you know in, in the photos that, that you shoot, especially when you're focusing on like someone's face, you know if they're just getting pelted with rain. Um, there's just, there's a lot more drama and, and whatnot happening within that photo. And, and for me, that's something I've always been drawn towards. So anyway, so second day of the hunt, uh, it is just nuke and rain like I've never seen. And I'm shooting a lot and I, I've got, you know, at the time I was using these, they're, they're I, I call them a glorified garbage bag because they're, they're basically a pl- plastic little bag that you put over your camera. Um, but you still got to slide your hand in there to, to get them, you know, to, to shoot the, the photo and. Um, I, I was getting a little lazy and I, I kind of had the back flipped up so that I could access my controls a little bit, a little bit easier. And I shot all day. I probably shot 2000 photos, but end of the day, the camera just like quit. I was like, Oh, dang it. That wasn't good. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, fortunately we were living on a, a big boat and we could dry everything out in the gear room every night, but that camera, it never came back on. So never came back to <laughs> life. Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> no rain and cameras don't mix. No, I mean, you know, some of them, they, they can definitely handle it a bit, but, you know, an entire day of just getting, I mean, that one definitely got worse. Mm-hmm. So I, I've, I've upgraded my, my rain protection um, a little bit, but. Oh, nice. They make better rain protection for them? Well, I mean, you could go with a full-on, like, um, like underwater housing. You know, that's going to weigh, like, I mean, just an underwater housing for a bigger DSLR camera probably weighs 10 pounds and the thing costs 1000 bucks. But but basically, the one I got, it's, it's a, uh, um, what's the brand, uh, Lens Coat makes mm-hmm. them. And, and they're basically just like a, a waterproof like cloth cover with um, kind of a drawstring on each end. Okay. Um, you just slide it right over your camera. I mean, it's not a whole lot different than the plastic ones I was using, but um, I don't know. I, I guess I haven't put it in some really bad conditions yet, so so we will see. But <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you're going to be back up brown bear hunting. Uh, is that in a wet spot? Did you say Kodiak? Is that what you Kodiak, said? Yeah. Oh wow. Have yeah. you ever been to Kodiak? Never have. No. Wow, that's going to be wild. Those things are giant there. Yeah, I, yeah. Seeing the ones. Well, we were. I was south of there when we were on our bear hunt last spring, but they weren't, I don't think they were quite as big. They were nine and a half feet versus 10 feet. And I was a little bit uh, blown away by the size of those things. So it'll be a, uh, it, it's fun. It's fun to be in that situation, taking photographs. Cause you're like, Oh, I don't have a weapon. I just have a camera. And like, there's, there's a level of fear that enters your brain that I, I haven't really experienced in, in a whole lot of other hunts. I have in like sketchy situations and places that we found ourselves, but not from like, fear of like a massive animal so mm-hmm. um so you know that's always kind of fun to put, put the fear of god back in you a little bit <laughs> makes for you sure alive, so. oh right yeah well, we were in alaska this past season we did a, a float for moose down a stream and then 
um, my buddy is an Alaska resident, and then his dad is next to Ken, so he could hunt grizzly bears. And um, yeah, so we they had a grizzly bear tag, and we spotted a couple really good ones. We spotted this one really good one, and we made a stock and made a play on it. And he had a rifle, and it was some great big rifle. I think he had a scope on it, but uh, it was like a 375. And so he really wanted to get 200 yards and in. Well, I'm a bow hunter, 200 yards, you know, I'd, I'd rather be at 100 yards or 50 yards or so. And so I kind of stalked with him, you know, I'd seen the bear across the river drainage. And so we went up there to stock for him and got in tight. And then we dropped down in the bottom and came up and we were just about 75 or 80 yards from him. And he was just feeding right there. And, you know, he wasn't quite the 10 and a half footer that you're talking about, but he was a really good boar grizzly inland grizzly, you know, and, and, uh, so he lined up on the shot, but the grass was covering most of the bottom of the body, you know? So the first shot he shot and gave it a haircut right across the back. And I didn't have, you know, I had my, my bow that I had laid down behind me before we went up the deal. Well, this bear, after that first shot turned and came right at us full speed, as fast as it could run, running right at us. And luckily he made the shot. Our second shot was right on the money and dumped <laughs> that thing. But yeah, all of a sudden it went from really fun stalking to, oh shit, I don't have a weapon. I don't have anything to defend myself. You know, I'm, I'm totally counting on him. But yeah, I know what you mean, that, that fear that comes over your when you're when you're hunting a dangerous game you know it's just part of it it's part of the fun though too no oh, indeed man yeah it's i i naturally kind of like to get myself out of my comfort zone in kind of everything that i do um even doing this podcast my first podcast every day that i was nervous out of my mind but uh, <laughs> no this one ain't so bad but uh yeah it's just it's really fun to, to get yourself way out like outside your comfort zone yes I mean, you, you come back from that an experience like that, or if it's just something big, the mountains, or like for me growing up, like skiing and ski racing, or um, just getting in really big, giant technical blinds in the mountains. It's like, you know, once you do it, you just you realize how capable you are. I mean, I, I still am always very smart when I do stuff, but it's just it, it gives you a lot of confidence, and it's it's a fun. It's a fun confidence to take back to everything that you do in life. Yes. So. No, it's a growing experience. Like as a person, it's so important to put yourself out of your comfort level. And I don't think you really learn until you're outside your comfort level. If everything comes easy to you and whether that's, you know, and for me too, putting on a podcast or public speaking or, you know, different guests or, and then you go into the mountains and you're hunting and you're pushing way past your comfort level, you know, when it's cold, when you're wet, more days than you want to hunt, more miles. But those are all like growing experiences in life and then when you come back to the real world and your job and taking care of things it doesn't seem like things are such a big deal you know you just you just accomplished or, or done life and death situations where you know you're you're keeping yourself protected and safe it is your own responsibility there's no helicopter that's going to pick you up there's nobody that's going to save you and when you face that seems like when you come back to the real world or real life like those those problems just aren't as big yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, for sure. Well, I wanted to have you in right now. We're just coming into shed season. Um, you're just a diehard shed hunter. You've been going really hard the last couple of years and had a lot of time during shed season. So I wanted to kind of talk over some shed hunting tactics and just some things for guys to, to go out and be successful and find horns as it's tough nowadays is there's a lot of competitions. It, it's really changed. Yeah, no doubt, man. There's, yeah, that, uh, we were just talking about before the podcast here, like how many, how many guys are, you know, blasting up all these different valleys and, and looking already. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very competitive. And, you know, I think there's a good reason. I mean, cat's out of the bag as far as shed hunting goes because it is really fun. And it's it's amazing to find really any any elk antler. I mean, I, you know, it, it still doesn't get old for me to, to walk up and see a shed. I mean, especially like one sticking out of the snow. It's just like one, one piece of the antler sticking out. You walk up to that thing and, you know, you pull it out of the ground. I mean, it's a... Um, it's a, a pretty cool experience. I mean, it's an adult Easter egg, hunt, I suppose, but um, a little bit better. So. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. Yeah, no, when you find one and it's a big brown shed and you, whether you know what it is or you don't know what it is, it's so exciting to walk up on those things. But they take just a, a ton of miles and a ton of research and a ton of glassing to find them. Um, so, so in today's day and age, um, that was so funny. You were telling me before we started that you had a couple guys that recognized you across a total drainage and were messaging you saying, Hey, you know, we see you over here and, and are you finding anything? And did you find that big shed? Dude, that's so wild. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can't, uh, well, it's part of my, my job, you know, I have a pretty large social following. So, you know, people certainly recognize me, which is, which is fine. I mean, my, you know, kind of 
my, my end goal with all this is to inspire people to get out there and mm -hmm. do it. And um, so, you know, you, you definitely, I definitely run into people all the time on the trail. They're like, oh, like, you're Stephen Green. I'm like, oh, great, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't mind it, but, you know, if, you, if you're in kind of a secret little hidey hole, and, um, it's, it's always makes it a little bit, uh, bit challenging. But, but no, there, there's just, there's so many people out there now, and it's, um, and for good reason, but, you know, I think the, the, the trick with it is to, for everybody that's really passionate about, about it and doing it, it's like, you know, we, def we definitely have to be cognizant of, of the bull elk and of, um, of the mule deer and, and not, not push them too hard. Um, just because you don't want to be an idiot out there. You don't want to be, um, and, and the reason I say that is I, I don't know, I can think of m many stories in my day of, of shed hunting and, and seeing, actually, like last year I was way up on this peak looking down and there was a, for like, like three days in a row I was camped on a um, pretty good bachelor group of bulls and there was a couple pretty big ones in there and um, out of nowhere this helicopter just starts buzzing all the ridges and it's it's a private helicopter. I, at first I thought I was like, was this like FWP? Like what the heck is this? It's it's a it's a private helicopter and it I mean they, they had to have been looking for sheds. It was it was kind of right before like the, kind of the prime of the shed season and um, they're just buzzing up and down all these ridges and they finally they, they, they come over to this like mountain over where I'm at and they see all these bulls and they just like dive bomb these things. I mean they were a hundred feet off the ground and all the elk just scattered and uh, and they, none of them had dumped yet and so the the uh, the chopper heads back to wherever it came from, and, and so I, I watch all these bulls, and they, they crossed this drainage, and they went up on top of this other mountain that into, you know, they, they were on this, this little grassy knob um, just surrounded by snow, and kind of, I think they had been living there pretty much the whole winter, but they moved into this area where it's just like, I mean, they, they went up to 10,000 feet on top of this, this huge mountain just in thick, deep snow, and I was just like, I, I just felt bad for them, and it's just like, man, you just, don't be an idiot, because like, those type of moves are, um, in, in my opinion, I think will only damage and um, prevent um, future shed hunting opportunities for everybody. I mean, and, oh. They're going to close it before we know. For so. sure. And and they're so fun to find. And you're not tagged out when you find one. You get to keep hunting yeah. and keep hunting sheds. But you're right. It's so it's so addicting and, and it's, it's caught on to where now, you know, and, and you just don't want to push the elk, especially like right now in this early season, before the green shoots have come up, before they have good feed while it's still deep snow. I mean, t for those elk to run all that energy up to 10,000 feet postal through all that snow, you know, you're just wearing down their reserves. And so, no, I'm with you. And, and right now there's a bunch of closures, you know, Utah is shut down for shed hunting, um, Colorado followed suit. I think they're shutting down a lot of oh, their yeah. shed hunting. Yeah, wait until, oh gosh, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's to April 1st was Utah. Yep. Um, yep. And so in, in a lot of the winter ranges, even around here in Montana, you know, the winter ranges in my valley, they shut down to shed hunting and they open it up, you know, whether it's, it's May 1st or, you know, sometimes they even push it back when they're big snow or big winter years. But, um, yeah, you want to be careful out there. I mean, it's all about the animals and it's all about the elk and you appreciate their shed so much, but you don't want to kill them trying to get them, you know? Yeah. And so, um, I'm with you. I like to hunt them real tentatively this time of year. And I like to, I like to keep my eyes on a lot of bulls this year. And I like to spend a lot of time watching and looking and all, I'll make some hikes and I'll look around, you know, here and there, but mostly I'm looking in their feeding features because when I'm there in the middle of the day and their feeding features, you know, they're in their beds and you're not blowing them up. And two, you know, if you blow up those elk, then you got to go relocate them. You got to find where they go or where they go off to. And they, they usually go into a deeper, darker hole, you know, in somewhere where they're a lot tougher to locate, but definitely this time of year, you want to hunt them tentatively and you you know, you want to be in the woods and you want to walk around, but I just spend a lot of time glassing them. And I'm, when I'm glassing them, I'm looking for a one horn or I'm looking for a no horn. I've still yet to see a bull shed out of the thousands and thousands of bulls I've watched and spend hours watching them. I've never seen a horn fall off their head. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, they'll come out and there'll be a one horn. And then the next day there'll be a no horn or there'll be a no horn with the group. And then I know, you know, it's just a matter of going where they've been and looking for that horn without going into their timber and their bedding zone and blowing them up. I like to wait till later in the year and later in the year, you know, they've got more green shoots, a lot of the snow is gone, and by that time, you know, they're kind of receding back into the mountains, and that's the time where you kind of go into their bedroom and look for those sheds, and there should be more of them in there by that time. Totally, totally. Yeah, I, I'm with you on the, the glassing part right now. I mean, right, right now, it's, um, we were talking before the podcast about 
well, I, I get the question a lot, like, oh, where, like, where do you look for elk? And so, I mean, first off, when do I look for elk? I, I mean, I'm looking for bulls, like, I mean, really right after hunting, like right, right after the fall hunting season ends, like, you know, a lot of them will kind of be in hiding, but they'll very soon come out to visible vantage, you know, visible areas where you can see them from a lot of times the road, a lot of times, you know, you got to hike in a few miles, whatever, but uh, generally they're, I found them anyway, like, you know, if, if you find the cow elk, look way, way higher and, and look <laughs> look into places where it's like there's no logical reason why an animal would live there other than there's a little grass patch. Like, you know, that that's where um, myself and a lot, of, a lot of my hunting buddies and shed hunting buddies, like that, that's where we really focus our time. I and mean, that's where you'll, you'll turn up some of these, some of these bigger bulls for sure. So. Yeah, well, and those bulls, they don't, you know, they're, they're diligent all the way through. They're not just smart during hunting season. They're smart year round. So even right now in shed season, they're not being hunted and they're not being killed, but they still like, just don't want to come down and live with the cows. They want to go up and they, they're usually living in bachelor herds this time of year. So you're looking for groups of elk. And, and for me, I'm, I'm like you, where I'm looking long distances. I'm looking off a lot of highways and roads farther than I'd look when I'm hunting elk because right now I can see a bunch of blonde bulls up there and I've got a snow background or a green tree background and I can kind of make out horns, you know, and, and, and make out antlers and know that it's a group of bulls. And usually this time of year, you see one bull, they're all bulls. Like usually the bulls aren't running with the cows. And so, yeah, I look super long distances, definitely look above the cows. Like you're saying, I think that's an important part. They're on the feeding features on the face and up higher up and through there. And then you want to look at the right times of the day. Yeah. You know, the really cool thing about shed hunting that's different than hunting is you can hunt all day long. You know, you, you're walking all day long for these things. So, you know, the, the best game plan for me is to glass the mornings and evenings when those elk are out on their feeding features, when you can glass them and see them out there. And then the middle of the day, you spend hiking around and doing your deal doing that. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I mean, selfishly, well, not selfish. I just, I just, I love the physical aspect of shed hunting. Um, it's, it's so much fun because you, I mean, literally it's the more you hike, the more opportunities that you might have. And it, it's quite a bit different than, you know, hunting, hunting elk in the fall, say, because for the most part, I mean, yes, you know, well, myself included, I've, you know, killed a few bulls midday, but a, a majority of your hunting in the fall happens first light, last light. Um, but with shed hunting, I mean, it's, it's an all day grind and I love the physical and endurance aspect of it. And you just go, go, go. And, um, and I don't know, I mean, sometimes it feels like an absolute lost cause. I remember last year, I, I just pounded country in this, this one area because I kept seeing this, this big seven point come out. And, uh, and then and he had one horn and he had no horns. And I like four days in a row, I, I bet I hiked 10 miles each day for those four days. And finally the fourth day, well, I, I actually, the fourth day I, I found an elk shed there finally. And it, and it wasn't even from that bowl, but it, it was a pretty good bowl. And it was, it was kind of ironic, but, uh, um, but just, you know, learning what you're capable of and, and also being able to really test your gear, um, um, especially, in, you know, springtime in Montana, especially it's the weather usually sucks. Uh, March and April, like those are our, our wettest wettest times of year, and um, you know, as far as suffering and, and learning how to suffer and suffer well, I mean, that's it's a it's a great time of year to, to really really push it and then learn about yourself and your gear. So. Oh man, for sure. I and I'm sure that endurance helps you out in all your filming and going to different places. You're just in great shape, but you're right. It is an all day grind. We used to have a saying between my circle of friends that. That when you're hunting horns, you walk till you hallucinate. And you do, you know, I've done marathons, I've done ultra marathons, I've never been so worn out as, as hunting sheds, you know. You, nice. you just go and go and go, and, and they're tough miles, too, you know. It's not... It's not just 10 miles on a paved road or on a trail. It's 10 miles, and you got to post hole through waist-deep snow at times. And, yep. you know, you just get stuck on the nastiest north-facing timber where, you know, the snow's up to your neck, it feels like, you know, and you're climbing over trees. And those are really tough miles that you're putting through, putting yourself through. Um, but you're right. Uh, hunting sheds is endurance, and it also teaches you that mental aspect, that mental toughness that's so important on all backcountry hunting and all hunts and shed hunting, but it's like you, you do, you lose hope, you know, you've been hiking for six, eight hours, you've hiked all these elk trails, you've looked in all the feeding features, and you haven't seen a horn, and, and like you, four days in a row of going up there, you know, that's day after day of having to pick yourself up, and keep yourself covering those miles, and, and keep thinking, and theorizing, you know, where's the next spot, where am I going to walk to next, where am I going to find that shed, so you're right, it is such a good teacher of endurance, and it it's just good experience hunting sheds 
I mean, it's added experience and it's, it's really made me the hunter I am, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, I dedicated myself to hunting sheds. That's, I just loved it, you know? And so, um, you know, you learn so much because you are hunting elk without the stalking aspect. You are finding elk through your glass and, and, and you're finding their feeding features and you're finding their bedding features. And then you have to look at 20 of those spots to actually walk and stumble upon a horn, you know? So, so it is, it's such a test of endurance and it's such a good learning tool to gain more experience in the woods and, and to further, you know, your evolution as a hunter. Shed hunting's a great tool for that. No doubt. Yeah. I have a lot to add to that as well as, um, so, yeah, I think that I learned the most. I also probably spend the most time um, in, in all my, my hunting. Um, I, I spend it mostly shed hunting because I, I learn more in, in my couple months of shed hunting in the spring than I do pretty much the rest of the year. And it, it really transpires over really well to the fall hunting season because you learn primarily what type of animals, like, like what quality of deer or elk live in certain areas. And uh, th- this last year, for example, um, we were shed hunting an area here in Montana and found just a pile of mule deer sheds in this, this area that we'd never, never spent any time in. And, and I was picking up, like there was a handful of like 150 inch mule deer. And I was like, okay, like, I mean, that, you know, enough of them to be like, I bet there's some quite a bit, quite a bit bigger ones in here. And, uh, so I, I had a hunch and, um, you know, last year went, uh, went there in late November and sh- ended up shooting my, my biggest, biggest mule deer uh, to date. And, and that was, based entirely off of the sheds that, that uh, I found in that, that area um, prior, prior to that. And, and honestly, I mean, looking at, looking at it on a map and everything that I knew about it, I was just like, eh, you know, everything other people were saying, I was like, ah, oh, I bet there's nothing really that great or outstanding in there. And, and sure enough, there was. And I mean, and it's, I think it's a, a place that holds potentially quite a bit larger deer than, than the one I shot. So, um, so anyway, I mean, shed hunting, you, you, yeah, you, you learn a lot about yourself. You're able to really push and grind and endure and, um, but you're you're really learning and expanding your knowledge base of the deer and elk um, in those specific regions. I mean, not to mention you're you're learning where they're living, where they're hanging out. You might find rut, rut sign, like really heavy rut sign in an area where yes, um, you know, and it's like, oh hey, like I, now I found this, like come back here in the fall. Mm-hmm. Um, so and, and it's an all it's an all day thing. You know, it's not like when you're scouting for deer and elk in the summer. I mean, you you look for the first two hours and the last two hours of daylight, and in the middle of the day, it's like you can't really learn a whole lot. No, nope. um, but with shed hunting, it's an all-day grind and it's an all-day thing, and, and you're, you're learning a new country. You're learning, you know, you're learning habit habits of these animals um, and the, the quality of animals that are living in areas which you can then reapply. And it's uh, for me and my own hunting and some of my friends, it's it's been a pretty pretty beneficial thing and def- definitely helped. And, yeah, for sure. Man, that uh, congratulations on that mule deer. That thing was just a stud. And Montana mule deer are really tough to kill, especially the big <laughs> ones like that. So good for you. Yeah, that's so awesome to hear that shed hunting is is what steered you into hunting that place, finding those sheds. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and like you say, um, you know, along with that, you're learning, you know, where elk like to hang out or where deer like to hang out and where they winter. And you're, you're taking you know, you're taking stock of what's there. You know, you know, I know when I'm seeing good bulls on the winter range, you know, I can theorize where they're going to be, you know, come hunting season and come the fall. I know they live in this mountain range. They've got to be on the top end or back over the top. But, you know, nowadays, even with migrating elk, they, they don't migrate, you know, I, I guess theories change at how far they migrate back. But, but my feeling is a lot of these bulls that I'm seeing in this mountain range, they aren't coming all the way from the park. They're living in the back end of these mountain ranges that have been through there. And so if I find a good bull or take stock of a good bull, you know, I know there's a couple 350 pluses in here, or a few 350 pluses. Like that's where I'm hunting next year. I'm going to go find those things in the summer and find them. But yeah, just along with what you said, you just learn where they're at then is a lot of times where they're at come late winter when they're migrating down or if you're following them later in the shed season, they're using using the same trails in the springtime migrating back up that they use in the fall to migrate down. Yep. And so you're finding these travel corridors that they like. And, and mule deer like where mule deer like. And elk like where elk like. I mean, you can theorize all day long on a map, but until you see tracks and trails and beds and scrapes, and, you know, that's where you really learn what elk and deer like to do. Yeah, no doubt, man. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's inter- shed hunting. I, I, all aspects of hunting. I mean, you, you definitely um, gain like a lot of wisdom and then ideas and then have theories. But it's it, for the most part, it's all theory and it's all speculation. And you know, you're always making educated guesses. But I um, is I, I really think for 
hunting and becoming a better hunter, especially if you're doing hunting in your own state and you have opportunities to hunt every year. I mean, like shed hunting, I think is probably the best thing, the best, best time investment that you can do um, to, to, to learning, especially, especially just learning new areas, learning about the quality of animals that might um, or might not live there. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and like you say, theories are just theories. They're just educated guesses. But the more experience you have, mm -hmm. the better those educated guesses get. Like yeah. the more I hunt high country mule deer, the more I know what good high country mule deer habitat looks like. And, and same thing with shed hunting and same thing with elk hunting. It all applies. But those educated guesses get better the more experience you have. Yep, yep, no doubt. I, I wanted to back up a little bit. Um, yeah, for sure. You, you were talking about sayings, and, and there's a saying that has been around for, for a while, and um, um, Sika's actually, Sika Gears, kind of adopted this as their, like, official official hashtag, and it's, it's uh, sick for it. And um, I, I first heard it from um, my friend Phil Larson, and then Phil just kept saying it, and it was just like, he's like, oh, yeah, man, I'm sick for it. I'm just, it took me a minute to kind of figure out what, what the heck that even meant, and then and then it, so I started saying it, and then and then I found out from him that that he heard it from from you, Brian. So I would love to hear. Well, sorry, I mean, so I started saying it, and then Sika happened to be look, looking for a hashtag, and you know I was saying sick for it all the time, and it happened to stick with them. And now I mean, it, it's got to be like the biggest hunting hashtag branded thing out there. I mean, there, I think there's 180,000 photos just on Instagram that are hashtag with sick for it. So I, I would love to hear like the origins of sick for it for you and like where, where you came up with it and, mm -hmm. and, and I guess what, what it means to you. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's a crazy deal. Like, uh, yeah, they picked it up and it's just kind of caught on, but yeah, we were saying it for years, all three of us, me, you and Phil and kind of caught on between our circle of friends here and there. And, and yeah, it, it, it happened with, with everything it was like oh shed season man i'm so sick for it you know or, or steelhead season i'm so sick to go catch some big steelies and it it caught on to where then we all started saying it around and then like you say sika picked it up and it's like this huge hashtag and so you know and i love sika gear and wear their gear all the time and so i use that hashtag a bunch but yeah i don't think guys know the whole story behind <laughs> it so um you're gonna love this so the origins of it actually came from like a ski documentary or snowboard documentary and i was just watching it one day and i i heard the saying and i can't even remember exactly what which one i was saying but it was kind of like an extreme sports saying and so these guys um they were saying they were so sick for the mountain or sick for the powder or sick for something you know and it just kind of stuck and it was like it made sense to me you know they had had changed their whole lifestyle around to go chase powder or chase these ski hills or or chase this deal you know and they 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 didn't you know they quit their jobs or this is what they were doing and all they were thinking about was, was riding powder or riding these steep hills and they said they were sick for it and i heard it a couple times in the documentary and so it just stuck and it's like man i'm sick for it i'm, I'm sick for hot and i'm sick for this and so it just kind of caught on and then caught on with my circle of friends and we all started saying it and so now it's just this saying that we always refer to but yeah i love it it just describes it so well like what we're doing and, and being hunting and, and and shed hunting you know and and when you when you have this burning desire to go do it and it's all you can think about it's all you train for you know then you're you're totally sick for it that's cool man i, I wanted to get that out there that brian barney was the one that started it or <laughs> well or maybe he got it from these these ski films so but either way no that's cool man. that's great to hear. yeah well it wasn't me originally i picked it up somewhere <laughs> too so i can't take total credit for okay. it but but yeah no it is just a great saying and and cool that sika picked it up and ran with it and it's doing good for them so well totally snowballed yeah it's, it's pretty crazy yeah i mean people i mean I've seen, I mean, well, actually, Phil has license plate. I've seen other license plates from other states. People put just sick horn on there or some variation of it. It's, just, it's crazy. It, it's a, it's probably the the best organic, like, hashtag campaign I've, I've known of. So, um, yeah, it worked out pretty well. So yeah, for cool. sure. Well, yeah, thanks for giving me credit, even though it's not my saying. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> we kind of started with our circle of friends saying it. But, yeah, cool, it caught on, and it, it does. It's such a good descriptive word to, to describe what we're doing out there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Sick for the sheds, huh? So you're going to head out pretty quick. So you lived out of the back of your truck last season for like a couple weeks or a month chasing sheds? Um, well, I mean, I was traveling all over the place. A lot of it was, yes, living in the back of my truck. Just I, I um, wasn't like super luxurious car camping by any means. I just put a board in the back of my truck. So I had a Kind of, kind of a divider where I could slide things underneath my truck and sit up on top and 
fill it up with totes of gear and food and everything and um yeah pretty much just went for it but uh, i love that setup with the canopy and then how did you set up the plywood with an elevated bed did you just build it yourself um i just had two pieces of two two, two by fours going across it's pretty uh well, it wasn't glamping by any means, but it worked for me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an awesome setup. I've always wanted that setup. Um, looked at it. My next truck, I'm going to have it for sure. I thought about it, putting it on this truck, but I just, you know, I've got 120,000 miles now. It's like, man, I uh, and they so match the truck that you put it on with the yeah. color and the, you know, the fit or whatever. But yeah, man, that is such a cool setup. I just always like that for travel. And one of my buddies runs that setup too. And yeah. Um, man, to sleep in that back of the truck, you just got your camp with you wherever you go. It's yep. so nice. Yep. Yeah, the only problem is, is if you if you are successful and you do start picking a bunch of sheds, you don't have enough room in your vehicle um, to sleep with them. Like I don't know. So I mean, a lot of times, like I would have to pull all my sheds out of the back of the truck and shove as many as I could just in the in the cab or put some underneath the truck, and then you know I'd wake up at five in the morning the next day to stuff it all back in the back so I could go out and feel that it was relatively safe like nobody would steal it so <laughs> another one of those good problems to have yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah good problem to have yeah good for you well getting some good sheds yeah and they i mean they they give good money for them now too and you know i was never into it for the money or never you know i picked them because i like to pick them and then i'd save my biggest sets and i'd hold on to them and i'd stash them in the corner and i oh i love the smell of sheds too do you oh. like the smell of them oh it's amazing you brought that up yeah that is my favorite smell by far you get a you get a bowl. And I, well, this is one thing I've learned is um, in the you get in these bachelor groups that are living in the timber. I mean, really anywhere. Like they, they rake trees year round. Mm-hmm. And you'll I mean, and I, that that always blew my mind because you'd you walk in, and you're like, man, it's like they're rutting in here. There's all these fresh rubs, and then you'd see that there was like fresh pine needles and stuff on top of the snow. So it's like, oh, they just did that. But anyway, so if you pick a you know pick a shed that's been in, in the deep timber or whatever, like it smells like it's kind of a musky like pine smell. Yes, or cedar smell. Oh, yeah, cedar, or, yeah. You get one that's been in the sage. You add a little sage to it, and it's it's. Kind of, I mean, if, if you could bottle that up and sell it as like a fragrance, like, <laughs> I, bet, I bet a guy could make a lot of money. On oh, that, but, I'd buy it for sure. Yeah, no. me too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, it, and there's no smell like it that yeah. what a horn smells like, you know. And yeah, especially when they're fresh and brown like that. Yeah. I could almost <laughs> just sit and smell a horn, you know. I just love that. Yeah. Um, That's funny you brought that up. Yeah, I, I posted a photo to Instagram probably a month ago, and it, it's it's me with a with a fresh head, and I'm and I'm taking a whiff of it. And I, I, I never, I, I mean, I had that photo for like an entire year and I didn't post it because I just thought people would think I was weird. And I was like, ah, whatever. So I, I posted it and like, it was amazing the response I got, like how many people also agreed with us that they, they smell awesome. So. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. All of us guys think they smell good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know about the girls, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and I also, um, I, I learned, I don't know why, why I know this, but so scent is the strongest sense tied to memory. And so, you know, anytime you like, Bull elk, whatever. I mean, we we literally are sick for it in mm-hmm. all senses of hunting, and so it's like when you smell that smell, it just like immediately takes you back to the elk woods. And mm-hmm. it, um, yeah, it's point being, it is a really amazing smell. So. Mm-hmm. No, it sure is. Yeah. Um, well, and those those sheds. So, like we were talking about glass and bowls in the early season. Right now, keeping our eye on them, and I glass them in the entire year i'm always looking for bulls or the entire shed season i mean the entire year really but the entire shed season i'm always trying to keep my eye on bulls i really think that's the key to finding sheds yeah yeah so like you keep your eye on them and you're looking for you know half horns or, or shed bulls but as it gets later in the season you know half of the crew will be shed and then half of the crew will have their horns and, and you're just paying attention to the features that they're on and the features they're like so you know where they've been yeah. And, and you're just taking taking tabs of all that country, and you're just making notes in your head that I'm going to hike to that spot, or I'm going to hike to this spot. Oh, I saw some bulls in there. There's been a crew living in there. And what you really want to find, I mean, the best case scenario is you find a group of bulls that nobody's chased out, that they've just lived there all shed season, and they've shed, you know, in their feeding feature and in their bedding feature, you know, and you're the guy to find them. You know, that's the best case scenario. That's where you go in and you you find 10 of those things in the timber, 15 of those things in yeah. the timber, you know. <laughs> but I love to keep my eyes on them. And then um, do you find a lot in the feeding features in the open, um, in, in the open grass and the meadows? You know some, but honestly, most of them. And I, I don't know if it's those if it's that those ones get picked by other people, but a majority of them are on, you know, north facers, which you wouldn't expect elk to be in, but they're they're in the thick timber. 
Okay. And you, you, you jump into this, that thick timber right, right outside of the, you know, right off the feeding, or yeah, right off those feeding features, and you start just following bull tracks in that really deep snow, and yeah. like, we, we find a lot of sheds, um, especially in that country. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I, I think you're right. Um, you know, I've always said that that 50% lose them on the feeding feature, 50% lose them in the bedding feature, you know, simply just because they spend half their time feeding during the night and half their time in the, in the bedroom, you know, when they're bedding throughout the day. But I, I think you make a good point that those ones in the feeding features get picked up because yeah. you can see them and you can glass them. And I spend a lot of time glassing open country and glassing feeding features. And I've spotted countless amount, amounts of horns, you know, in those open feeding features. And so I'm always looking over those and those are my first go-to, but you're right. Like you, you 25% of those, or, you know, 50% of that 50% gets packed, picked up really quick, you know, and then those ones get seen and picked up. And so you don't find a whole lot on those South facers or those open feeding features because they get grabbed and because it's so competitive nowadays. I mean, you can hardly hike anywhere and not be on a set of boot tracks. It's got that popular. And so now you know, the key is, is once it gets later in that season is finding their bedroom and finding where they're bedding. And you're right. It's like following those trails from those feeding meadows and you got to follow them back in and find where they're bedding in that thick, gnarly downfall timber. And it's amazing how high an elk can walk. Like you can follow them from the feeding feature and 500 feet above and think you're getting there and maybe find some beds and think you're in it. But a lot of times those things will go a thousand feet higher on the hillside or 2000 feet higher on the hillside. Like they'll go a long ways to their bedroom to kind of avoid hunting, you know, uh, shed hunting pressure or, or to try to hide or whatever they're trying to do, but they will go way in the heck up there. You'll spend all day chasing them trying to just find, you know, where they're, where they're bedding down at. Is that what you find too? Oh yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, they, they, they go to places where, the logic, I mean, there is no logic, at least in, in our human minds, to, to why a bull elk would be where he's at. But, I mean, they're they're always there. I mean, they're, they're in, so, in survival mode, and they just want to be somewhere safe and secure and kind of away from everything, and and they certainly find themselves up there. Um, one thing I've, I've certainly found with, um, like you say, I mean, things are really competitive nowadays, and, like, there's always boot tracks. And um, one trick I've found that has, has really yielded Quite a few sheds. I mean, I, I bet, well, I don't know if I can say this, but I bet, I bet half of the sheds that I found, like last year anyway, were in areas that had already been shed hunting. Like, people have been in there. It doesn't matter what day of the week. People go in. Um, but I would I would always walk different line. You know, if, if there's a big ridge, most people are going to walk right on top or just, just left or right of the big ridge. But I would always, like, go way out of my way to walk down underneath the ridge, through the crap. You know, it, it's it's a pain to walk in, but, like, I've found more sheds doing that than probably anything. So if I'm with a buddy and he's just kind of like, oh, I'm going to walk top of the ridge, I'm like, oh, I'm going to fool you. And so I, I go way off the side of the ridge into the, kind of the crappy stuff. It's, you know, it might be snow, it might be just slipping and sliding, but that's, like, I've found so many sheds um, in country like that. And I've also noticed just watching elk that a lot of them don't necessarily just, I mean, they won't be right on top. They'll always be down off the ridge a little bit. And I... I just started noticing that this year, as um, this last week, been been looking at probably, I don't know, probably 150 bulls in the last last week, and it's like you look at a lot of them, and very few of them are right on top of some some ridge line there. They're always down off the side a little bit, and so I, I don't know, kind of naturally just apply that to my my own when I hike, and you know, it makes the hiking harder, but it's like, well, the point is to hopefully find shit. so it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna go out of my way to walk through the the nastier stuff, and it's it's definitely yielded. Oh, sure, dude, but. that's a great tip. I had never thought about that, but but you're right. When you're walking a hillside, and when it's dry, there's trails going all they all they're always side hilling on yeah. that stuff. Man, I had never thought about that. Um, I, I'm the dummy always walking on the top of the ridge. <laughs> well, part of it is because like there's always some other track of some dude that are, okay. someone else that walked across the top. I'm like, well, I can't walk there, so I think naturally it just forced me to walk in other places that I've kind of found. I was like, oh wow, this actually is a pretty good theory still so. that's a really good tip i like that yeah for sure well and, and you just and and you do like you find them in the feeding or in the bedding but there's a lot in that transitional area when they're moving through i mean if you think about it you know that's when they're when they're going up and down and pounding and jumping over logs and things so that's a good place to kind of jar a shed loose too oh very much so yeah that uh, earlier we were talking about i spent four days right in this one spot and i 
um, the, the, the shed that I did find, there was, it was a, a bull track and he jumped over this, like this big, big chunk of deadfall and he had, he had to get pretty high, but when he landed on the other side, shed just popped right off and it was just laying perfectly in the snow. I was, it was, wow. See, seeing a fresh shed laying in the snow is probably one of the more beautiful sights I've ever seen. I don't know about you, but oh, I, man. I, I do a little happy dance every time that I <laughs> Especially like a brown one just oh, laying yeah. on that white snow and you know it's fresh, you know. For some reason, you know, and I don't mind finding white ones either, or antiques we call them, or yeah. <laughs> year olds. You know, those are good too, but there's just something about a fresh brown that's just so fun to find. Oh, no doubt, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like finding whites too just because it, it always – adds to the to the knowledge bank and you're, you're kind of bummed you're like oh dang like especially if you've been in your area a lot you're like oh how, how did i miss this one yeah. last year um but uh so, um a couple years ago um one of my, my friends isaac and i we were way up this basin and uh we were we were, we were in the the thick like kind of like the north facing you know bedding areas just really thick dead folly timber and um and it's an area that definitely gets hit pretty hard, and so we weren't didn't really have any expectations. But we were just kind of out there learning a new country, and I come along, and there's like, yeah, you know, I was just kind of doing that same theory that I was talking about, not not walking the obvious path. I was like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go down into this kind of thicker, steeper stuff where it's, yeah, it's kind of a pain to walk. But it's like, well, maybe an elk drop there because there's already, I mean, there were some other dude's boot tracks right above me, so I'm like, well, I gotta walk out here because it doesn't make any sense to walk in his tracks, and so so I'm going along and. Uh, Sure as heck, there's a there's a big it's like a white tine sticking out of out of the snow, and so I yelled at my buddy Isaac, and he comes over, and he I'm like, I'm like I don't know, man, this looks like a pretty good one, and it, you know we we hadn't picked any sheds that year, it was it was super early yet, and um so so he sets up the camera, and he's like, oh, I'm just gonna film me film me pulling it out of the snow, so I pull it out of the snow, ends up uh, the, the tine that was sticking out ended up being a a, a 25 inch G3 off wow off this old white shed that had probably been there three years. And shocking, I mean, it had a few chew marks, but it was like, you know, 99% intact. And uh, and that, that bull, I mean, it's it's like just blowing our minds because um, it, it, as a single, it was a 188 inches. Jeez. And so, if, you know, whatever, you had 40 inch spread, and multiply that by two, you, I mean, it's basically a, a 420 inch bull. And it's like, holy wow. Crap. So, and, you know, and since then, we, we've actually found, I guess, like four, four pretty good sheds you know, within two miles of this, this one area, but we've never, like, we look religiously and we have never seen like a really big elk here. So it, it's just really interesting because you, you, you know, they're there, but you never see them. Even, okay. even when you really look like, it's like, well, are they not coming out until dark? Like, what, where the heck are these things? So it, it's always interesting to, to find animals, um, antlers and kind of in a way, build a relationship with them and build a relationship with an animal that you've never seen before, but you know, they exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that t- to me, and I know my friend Isaac. That's that's certainly, certainly a, a uh, um, an allure to to it. And you yes. know, and, and a lot of times when we'll we'll hike way in deep in December and, and January and February or early February and just trying to spot these bulls. Be like, well, we know they're somewhere in here, but mm-hmm. you, you still can't find them. So it's mm-hmm. it's always interesting to uh, to have that. So yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, phantom bulls, like you say, and and some of the biggest ones I picked, I haven't glassed up. You know, I love to glass them. I love to keep my eyes on them. Well, and a lot of the biggest bull I, bulls I've kept my eyes on, I've never found their sheds. You right. know, <laughs> they just they disappear or they get bumped, and I. Um, yeah, it's so wild. You do build a relationship with them because you're following their tracks or you find a shed that they've left behind and you learn that there was a bull living there, you know, but you, but you can't always see him there. Um, no, that's a, a wild part of it for sure is, is, uh, hunting a shed of a bull that you've never seen, you know, just walking around, but you're learning country and you're gaining knowledge, you know, everywhere you go. Um, you know, and, and those things, you know, they, they, they drop. You know, you can follow tracks for miles and miles, for 20 miles, for 40 miles, and you may not find a shed, but all of a sudden you walk that right trail where he dropped it, you know, and there it is, laying off the side of the trail. It's such a rewarding a rewarding sport. It's so fun to get out this time of year and travel yeah. some country and look for those things. Yeah. No, yeah, on that on that note, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can spend four days or a week or however long. You, I mean, you can have 10 days in a row where you just get skunked, and then all of a sudden you'll walk some ridge. And this happened to me last year. I found... I think what was it, six six browns within like uh-huh. four hundred yards of each other, uh, and, and I, like, I spotted like four at one time, and I was just kid the candy store. And I <laughs> there was another dude on on the ridge just across like adjacent from me, and I was just like, oh crap, look, he's gonna get over here. So I am just sprinting up and down this hill trying to pick every shed. Like 
wasn't even taking photos because I was just like, <laughs> not the priority right now. <laughs> yeah, you go a little shed crazy when you start finding them. Or I know when I see one, you know, I almost feel like somebody's going to get to it before oh, yeah. I am. You know, you're just <laughs> racing to it to try to get to it. Yeah. Um, well, and a, a lot of hunting those bulls, you know, you watch them and feeding features, bedding features. But but nowadays, you know, with all all the competition, these bulls are getting spooked out of their spots, you know, and guys are walking them when they see a, a half horn bull or a shed bull and they'll walk right in their beds and, and spook them. You know, a big key to shed hunting, I think, is finding where those bulls go to. And they tend to, when they move off their primary feature, it's getting later in the season, there's better grass, better feed, and they can go higher. But man, they really go in the gnar when they get spooked off a spot. It seems like they can just go live in the nastiest country back and through yeah. there. But I think that's a big part of it nowadays with the competition is is not always looking, you know, where the elk are right now because yeah. where they are right now, they're going to be bumped from that spot. Yeah. You know, within a week, you know, they're going to be bumped from that spot. Somebody's going to spook them out of there. The key is finding where those bulls go in their next feature they're going to live on, you know. And so keeping your eyes open, paying attention to tracks and trails, and then just hiking country and trying to figure it all out and, and put the pieces to the puzzle together. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting point you bring up because cause I really do invest so much time into glassing in kind of the winter months. And I, I, I mean, I don't know that I've ever found a shed where I glass the elk because for the most part, somebody goes in like way too early, walks right through all of it thinking that, I mean, and, you know, there is, you know, rare instances that, you know, some, a really big bowl might, might drop super early, but generally, like, they don't, I mean, mm -hmm. at least that I've found, I mean, um, and so those elk just get pushed to the wildest, weirdest places, and it's like, like, well, okay, I, I knew that, I knew that this elk lived here once, but I don't know where the heck he went, so. <laughs> yeah, I know it, well, and I, you know, I picked up some early sheds, but, but too, I've seen some of the biggest bowls, the big 385, 390, you know, even approaching that magical 400 mark. And I've watched these bulls and, you know, you, I picked up sheds, you know, as early as February 28th. And, and I picked them up March 2nd, March 3rd, March 6th. I remember picking up a set. So I picked them up early, but I just keep going out day after day. And this bull still keeps packing his horns and packing his horns. You know, and he, he may be the biggest bull in the group. And then pretty soon they're bumped and you, you know, then you got to try to figure out where they go when they drop around March 15th or March 20th or, you know, I'm sure all all different type parts of the country are different when they drop and a lot of big bulls you know don't drop until april 1st too you know and so you got to kind of hunt them tentatively and, and hunt them intelligently you know where you're not you know if you know where a batch of bulls are last thing you want to do is go in there and bump them all out of there then you got to go, go relocate them and refine them again you know and and plus you're putting pressure on the elk you know which we talked about earlier but um yeah, I think I think a big key nowadays is trying to figure out where they go next or where they are at. So you want to keep glassing throughout shed season to to know what they're doing. Totally. Yeah, for sure. But it's just so much fun. It's so cool to hear your story of that mule deer, and that's the reason you killed that good buck is finding all those sheds in there and where those mule deer are like. Did you kill them in the same area or did you kill them up higher? Um, it was. I mean, well, actually, so I, I hunted. I, did, I didn't even get to the spot where I found most of the mule deer sheds um, you know, in the spring, and I, I was just, you know, I, I had with the flexibility of my, my career. I mean, I had uh, a pretty good chunk of November uh, to myself, so I went drove way out to the spot and just was going to live out of my truck for like a week, just like just give for hell. And uh, I was like, okay, first day, you know, I didn't didn't get there till two in the morning, so I'm just going to take kind of take it easy. And so I, I hike into the spot and. Um, I think I saw like 16 mule deer bucks in there. I was oh, like, wow. Geez, I mean, there's just, that's a lot of deer. That's a lot of bucks. Yeah. I mean, and none of them were like huge, but there, I mean, there was so much rut activity and it was pretty open country. I was like, okay, like there's, there's potential. So I'm like, I, I'm going to make one more loop through this tomorrow. And, you know, and it was an area um, that there, there was, you know, four wheeler access and, and there was guys riding their four wheelers through there, but they would just stick to the roads. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I hiked two miles past kind of the four wheeler section and, and like, I mean, I ended up, I think I saw like 35 bucks. Wow. And, you know, and the one I ended up shooting, I mean, I just seen so many deer. I was kind of losing like perspective of like what a bigger deer looked like. And I finally saw this one and I was like, oh, he's like the biggest one I've seen, but I just like could not like tell how big he was. And so I'm sitting there, I got my spotter on him. I'm, you know, phone scoping him, filming him. And then I, I, I get into like 180 yards and I'm filming him some more. I was like, I was like, oh dang, I could shoot this deer and get it on the film, which I, you know, I don't care that much about, but I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And, um, so finally I was like, 
like, oh, this is pretty sweet. So I, I got pretty stoked on it. And so I decided to pull the trigger on him and walk up. And I, it, it, and honestly, it took like three days for me to realize that, I mean, I was, I was thrilled. I mean, he was, I, I knew he was probably the biggest deer I ever shot, but I just could not tell. Mm-hmm. And then I, I got him back to the house like, a few days later and I finally measured him and I was like, am I measuring him right? I, you know, I had to pull up the, the measuring, you know, the chart or whatever on the internet just, just to verify. I was like, oh crap, I guess this is a pretty big deer. So, um, for Montana, um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, shed hunting. I mean, it's pretty awesome and what it, what information it can can provide. And I, I'm, I'm excited to go back out to this spot this spring and, and shed hunt, and also hunt it next fall, just because I, the bigger sheds that I was finding weren't, weren't even right in this this one little little pocket. They were all in this other area. So I, just, I, I have a hunch there might be some pretty big animals living in that country. I think you've stumbled upon a pretty good mule deer spot, it sounds like. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, just through shed hunting. Yeah. Well, it's so funny. Uh, shed hunting also teaches you what big is, doesn't it? I mean, oh, yeah. like, you actually get to hold a 320 bull in your hands because you put a tape on them, you give them a spread, and you go, gosh, that is a 320 bull or that is a 350 bull in it. Like, when I was first starting elk hunting, it's tough to judge elk and figure out what elk are. Like, it takes seeing a lot of them, you know, and and to really know. But it's nice when you can pick up the shed and go, okay, this is what it looks like, you know. And and same thing with deer. Funny, I had a cameraman this year named Dalton, and Dalton killed a giant buck out of Wyoming. Like, I think it's been, you know, not this season, but the season before. And he was going to film for Ike and, I think, Brandon Mason. And he's actually like a... Yeah, Brandon Mason was kind of his mentor through church and some different things. Brandon Mason works for Eastman, um, or, or maybe it's Scott Reeker. Sorry, I'm getting my story wrong. But he told Scott, uh, Scott was his, his mentor through church and through growing up or whatever. And so he was supposed to meet up with those guys and film. And so he calls them and he says, well, guys, I, I shot a buck, you know. And they said, well, how good is it? You know, and he goes, oh, you know, I, I it's a four point. It's a nice buck. It's probably the best I've ever killed. You know, I think it's 160, 170. And. And uh, so those guys ended up meeting him so they could see his buck, or I, I can't remember if they helped him get it out or how the story went, but they went and saw that buck, and they, they went, hey, you're kidding me. It was like this 195-inch huge dark horn muley, but, you know, he just hadn't seen a lot of big muleys on the deck or whatever, and so he didn't really know what he had, what he had killed. But that's what shed hunting does is it helps you, like, you actually see the horn and see the size of it and put a score to it. And like it, it makes you better at judging and knowing what big is and knowing what big looks like, I think. Oh, totally. I mean, you finally have a, you finally have perspective of what, you know, what 160 inches is, what 170 inches is, or, you know, for L350 or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't get too cut, super caught up inside. I mean, I, I love to kill mature animals, but it, it's always fun to, you know, in, in my house, I've got, kind of a, a big open area with a bunch of big sheds on it. And, you know, it was like, it was like a 380 set and there's that like 400 inch bowl and there's elk that I've killed. And so, you, you know, I look at those every single day and then you go out in the mountains and you actually see elk and you can, I feel like get pretty dang close within like 10 inches or five inches of probably what that animal is. And uh, so, it, so it's fun to be able to really analyze elk and, and you know, when you, when you have sheds to look at every day, you can apply that so yeah fun learning tool isn't yeah, it no yeah no just being able to actually touch them and then see them and like you say it, it just makes you better in the mountains judging them you just know what you're looking at know what you're looking for too yeah. um and, and that too can kind of spoil you too you 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 pick bigger sheds than you do a shoot bulls you know and that's your goal is you always pick these giant sheds and i you know, eight by eight sets, or you pick a seven by eight, and you just go, gosh, I just love to kill that thing with my bow, you know, and, and then that's the goal, is to try to learn and gather enough information to harvest one of those, and and you've been really successful on bulls and killed some really nice bulls, but it's always tough to kill that that next level bull or those sheds that you pick, but that's the goal, that's what keeps you going. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you pick them, then you, you know it's like, okay, well, one exists in this this chunk of chunk of the mountain, so <laughs> I guess I'll focus there. Yeah, for sure. Isn't that the truth? Yep. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, yeah, I just want to thank you again, Steve, for for making the drive down and coming on and being on Eastman's Elevated. Man, it's so fun to talk to you, whether we're talking hunting or talking sheds. Uh, you know, your photo skills are just absolutely off the charts. I can't tell you, like, I... You know, I'd, I'd say, you know, you're one of the best out there, but, dude, I really think you're the best out there. I just love looking at your photos. You know, you're so good at what you do. So just keep up the good work, and I can't see, I can't wait to see what you come up with, you know, not only hunting season, but your photos, and then also shed season. You're going to get a little time to shed on, aren't you? 
Yep, yep. We got the next next couple of weeks, and then uh, this is a very good problem to have. But I'm, I'm heading to to New Zealand for like 15 days, and then like right when I get back, probably headed to Alaska for another 15 days. So I'm, I'm going to miss the kind of the, the prime of, of shed season. But uh, again, great problem to have. So I'll be out doing you know photographing and filming some pretty awesome hunts. So can't can't complain. But. Yeah, for sure. Well, and yeah, you'll get it early, and I'm sure you'll get it late too, and yeah. and get all the the openers, you know, of all the um the winter range openers you know those are always fun to hit there's always some good sheds on those things so i'm sure you'll get your fair share you always do yeah. the, the openers are like bring the lightest pack you can and prepare to sprint your tail off because <laughs> that's what everybody else is doing so it, it, it's 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 pretty entertaining if you're a competitive person you would really enjoy those because you just you pretty much run until you drop and some people do and i don't know it's, it's uh yeah it's last year that was very much the case oh yeah they're they're fun they're they're not the same as like shed hunting this time of year or throughout the year where you kind of get the experience and you're in the mountains and you kind of find your chi and have fun with it but those no it's a dead sprint i like to glass them like before i go a couple days before (laughs) i go i'll glass from like the legal roads you know you can get on and i'll spot sheds up there and i'll have some picked out that are in the feeding features but you're right they open those gates and you know, I think there's supposed to be a speed limit, but trucks are just flying <laughs> up the road, you know, and so you're, you either join it or you get left behind, but yeah. yeah, you hit there and then, and then you pile off the road and you're right. I, you start running up the mountain as fast as you can run up the mountain to gather those sheds and try to beat guys <laughs> to them. And, and then you get up in the timber and you're able to kind of walk around a little bit. There's a lot of guys that do it, but those openers are a good introduction in it. And not even an introduction, just a another facet to shed hunting where you can get out and go find some nice browns out there. Oh yeah, and then well, before we wrap it up, I mean, shed hunting it's it's very much a social activity, and it's you know it's really fun to do with friends, and it's fun even if you split up for the day, you come back and you share all your your knowledge and experience, and you know, or you find a big one, your buddy comes over and you celebrate. I mean, there's 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 a it's a it's just a very fun fun thing to do, and I mean it's it's. Of all the hunting and stuff that I do, is probably my favorite. And for the longest time, it was, you know, in the springtime, there wasn't really anything else going on with, with my career because most of my photography and everything was kind of locked in with the fall. And so springtime was like, oh, this is this is like my, my time to, you know, spend time in the mountains and, you know, spend 30 days in a row shed hunting. And, uh, um, yeah, it, it's an amazing, amazing thing. I encourage everybody to, to get into it or consider it. And, um I think you'll, you'll, you'll learn a lot and you'll become a more successful hunter um, through it. Oh, for sure. No, I love that social aspect of it. Um, no, you're so right. It's so fun to share with friends and it does, it just makes you a better hunter and gives you more experience and another chance to, to learn and be better in the mountains. So no, I'm with you, man. Cool. Well, yeah. Um, good. Well, yeah, I hope you have a good spring. Can't wait to see your sheds. Guys can follow you on Instagram, Snapchat. Yep. Um, where else can guys find your photos? Um, so Instagram, uh, it's at Stephen Drake photo and that's Stephen with a V and then Snapchat, um, it's annuli collective and that's a N N U L I collective. And sorry, there's no E on the end of collective. Uh, there wasn't enough characters in on, on Snapchat for, to allow me to do the whole collective. So, so annuli collective without an E and, uh, yeah, I posted a bunch of stuff there working on a few kind of cool new projects where we may take like, uh, basically like a satellite device into the field to be able to do live updates from pretty much anywhere in the world so um def- definitely follow along on, on those platforms probably some hopefully some really cool things uh, to come so wow way cool yeah no that's uh that's next level stuff and then um also i think i've seen some of your short films that you've done on Sitka. do you still have some on there um you know i do i since i've so i've, I've been uh, kind of a freelance photographer for the last uh, basically a year and a half almost two years and um, since going out on my own, I, I really have, have stayed pretty um, specific with photography. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Sitka, there, there's a pile of films on there, quite, quite a few that I've been involved with um, from from previous um, episodes in my life. So def- definitely check that out. And my, my website, too, it's annualicollective.com. Um, there's some fun, fun photos and stuff on there. So. Man, I bet. Yeah, no, like I say, you're the best photographer I know, uh, photographer that I know. Um, your photos are just next level and, and, uh, you live such an adventurous lifestyle. You're such a great follow, you know, through all your platforms. So thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Another episode in the books. Uh, boy, these things are clicking off quick, but that was a really fun episode sitting down with Steve. Uh, that guy just lives such an adventurous lifestyle. I mean, 
he, he's just always in the mountains. He's hunting sheds or hunting or taking photos on some exotic hunt. And guy just has a ton of experience and a ton of knowledge. So really fun to sit down with him and, and talk things over. And, and, and I got to schedule him for another one down the road and talk about some of the adventures he has. So he, he's just a wealth of knowledge. So really fun. Um, this episode was brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse. Um, make sure to give them some love, guys. It's a great company. Uh, you can actually go in, go in and try on what you need and talk to a knowledgeable staff and get all the right information. And those guys are working really hard to, to be a good company and get all the right information out. So uh, go check them out. Um, with that, um, I'm headed over to Wyoming. Got some good things for the, the future of the podcast going. So I'm going to go over to the head office and uh, we got some great podcasts scheduled with those guys where we're going to dive deep into the hunting world. So um, should be some great episodes. And, and we got some other guests coming up. So just really excited of the future of the podcast here. And, and, and just want to thank you guys for all the support, you know, with the podcast. And, you know, I've got a Facebook and Instagram page for Eastman's Elevated. You guys have been great at supporting me on there. And, and without you guys, you know, you guys are the ones that make this podcast work. So just want to thank you guys for all the all the support everywhere. I really appreciate it. And just going to keep working hard to getting good guests and good content out. So um, with that, you guys keep working hard. Um, shed season now. Time to go walk around the mountains a little bit. And hunting season's coming soon. So keep working hard, guys, and check in with you next week.